it up. <laughs> Congratulations on your debut album, man. This Thanks. is a huge milestone. Oh my God. Is that the vinyl of it? Or is that a That's poster of it? No, <gasps> what's the What's the actual vinyl look like? Is it colored? Is it plain? What did we go for? We have a few. So we have my favorite ones, probably like the, we have like a pastel pink one. Um, and then the JB Hi5 exclusive one is like a Coke bottle green, which is kind of like close to the album cover color. Um, and then we've got like a standard black one. So yeah, I'm very Best proud of it. Every world. Yeah. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. How does it feel having reached this milestone? I imagine this has been years in the building. Yeah. Oh my gosh. That's like such an understatement. It feels like, and I feel like I'm only starting to feel I guess the weight of that now, mm. like in the lead up to it, when it's like, oh, it's it's almost nearly like two weeks till the day. But I've been wanting to make an album like for pretty much my whole life. Like, I mean, singing was kind of the only thing that I was really ever interested in to this extent. Um, and then when I started writing songs, I definitely, I don't know. I kind of feel like I started thinking about writing an album um, pretty, much immediately and then I would like draft little track lists like imaginary track lists and like sketch the record <laughs> in my journals in the back of the car like it was all just like a fictional imaginary land and then over time I just became so obsessed with that hobby in my life that it became my job so yeah this is a big time and it feels like the weirdest time possible to like actually put something like this out into the world but you know I'm still <laughs> super excited yeah, good. We don't wait for no one. Um, all right, what's this like in between <laughs> period feel like? You mentioned it's two weeks out from the time that we're having this chat. And it's like the album's done, but no one's got a hold of it yet. Is it kind of weird just being like, there's nothing else I can do? Or maybe there is, but I'm just waiting. A little bit, yeah. I think that you you think a lot about you can get into this like mental like vortex of just like oh my gosh because you have the time in the lead up and it's all that you're thinking about of just like oh I really hope people like it like what are people gonna think and I think that I guess when you say that whole thing of like oh what else is there that I can do I mean ideally now I would have been playing shows like I'm just I've just lost another two because of our lockdown extension and I think that maybe doing those shows would have made me feel a little bit more comfortable with everything but I mean, this is just kind of like our reality. It's just how it is. It's, you know, and I think that something I am going to try and get people to focus on is that I suppose pandemic or no pandemic, we live in a time where records are digested in a way, unless they're like maybe super upbeat and like dance music based, where people put their headphones on, go on a walk or on the train or whatever. And they have a very like solo private experience, like listening to a record for the first time. Like, I feel like I know a lot of people who take in music in that way and then it becomes theirs and they have their own personal journey with it. And then when a show finally does happen, then everyone can like celebrate those feelings together, but they all have their specific association with it. Um, and so I feel like I am fortunate in that sense because I do feel like I've made a record for that way of digesting it um rather than like i mean the craziest example is like dua lipa doing her sophomore record campaign like all throughout the past two years during a pandemic and it's a dance music record you know and so i guess that brings about a new challenge because it's like ideally we would want to do this all together we would want to do this all in a room but like you know if she can fucking kill it you know with that kind of genre which obviously she has i love her so much um <laughs> but yeah, I think that I just need to focus on the fact that I'm fortunate that I think that this record will be one of those albums that is more like one-on-one -on -one based in terms of just like how people take it in. Um, and that means that, you know, if we have to wait to play shows for a bit, then that's okay. They can just get to know it a little bit, if that makes sense. I love that you've thought about that experience. And I, from personal experience, can say that I have walked around doing like the Bondi to Kuji walk or whatever listening to your music just solo really oh my god I just yeah. got <laughs> <laughs> oh, like I think I'm that's so glad oh yay okay like when I'm like when yeah. I was like oh I really need to feel some feelings right now I was like I'm just gonna listen to some Greta Ray go on a walk see some beautiful ocean I live like in a west so it was a trek to get oh there in the god. first place and I was like oh, wow oh my gosh that's amazing thank you so much 
No, thank you. Um, yeah, well, I guess the audience has already had a good taste with all of the duologies that you've been releasing. So yeah. regardless of not hearing that like feedback from the shows, you've had that drip feeding feedback. What was the idea behind duologies? How did you come up with that concept and want to release it that way? Well, the duologies idea kind of came about when I guess we were thinking about, me and my team, we were thinking about how this album was going to come together in a way where it was quite large and it is, it's quite long. Um, and I am a storyteller first and foremost, like no matter what genre of music I'm making and I knew that it was going to be quite dense. And I think when you give people something, especially as like a newer artist that has kind of shifted genres a little bit, I knew that it was going to be like a lot to give people all in one go. And so the idea of that traditional rollout of just like, here's the first single, couple of months, here's the second single, wait a bit, here's the whole thing with like maybe one more single to go with the album. I just knew that that wasn't really going to work for this record. I think there was a lot for me to unpack. I really like to address things. I like to be like, I did this. Now here's a list of reasons why I did this. Um, and so I think that the duologies kind of gave me an opportunity to be able to do that throughout the campaign, as well as just, you know, unpack the themes of the record in a more like honed in on the ideas kind of way. Um, because I feel like giving people the record without having I don't know, picked it apart a little bit at first. I don't know, I think that it, it meant that my audience gets a chance to A, know what to expect, but B, get to know like me as an artist and where I'm at now a little bit. And also, yeah, just get familiar with all of the feelings and emotions on the record. So when it arrives in its full form, it's probably a little easier to listen to and like understand. So, yeah. yeah, yeah, totally fair enough. And I've loved the little series that you've been doing with each of the duologies of like, chatting about the songs and you're in the studio when you recorded this and then you're over in London doing this one. Um, but also you've talked about how this album overall is the capturing of like uh, an expanding world for a young teenager fresh out of high school. What type mm. of what type of teenager were you? Oh my gosh. Um, what type of teenager was I? Um, pretty boring. <laughs> uh, I, I just wanted to play music and that was pretty much it. No, I, um, I, when I was kind of like in that whole stage of stepping into the music industry and, you know, releasing Drive and that period of my life, I would say probably more than anything else, like I remained like a pretty studious person. Like I really enjoyed the classes that I selected to do for myself in like the final years of high school because I knew that they were going to ultimately serve what it was I wanted to spend my life doing which was music so I think in that sense I was lucky that I had a high school and teachers that were quite accepting of the fact that I also simultaneously was like I'm going to go on tour like in the middle of year 12 do you mind um because I wanted to show that I was committed to I guess like both things like I'm really committed to doing this artist thing long term but also of course I want to finish school and I, I love to study and learn things and so I think that probably first and foremost I mean I am really fortunate to have like you know, a lot of really close friends and I have like the same two best girlfriends that I've had since primary school. <laughs> That's um, so nice. Which is very, very nice and very grounding. And yeah, I think that like, I would have liked to think of myself as like a bit of a sponge of a teenager. Like I definitely really loved to learn whether that be in music or in school. And I think that I've brought that part of me like into I, I think that's like remained as a thing, but um, yeah, I definitely wasn't like, you know, cool, I guess. Yeah, <laughs> dude, straight up, me too, <laughs> right there with you. I wasn't rebellious, all those rebellious teenage songs, I'm like, I can, I can imagine it, I can't relate yeah. to it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Did your school kind just... of realize as you're going through this stage of your life, because it was super intense, you were winning some of the country's like biggest songwriting awards, you, they were obviously there for the Triple J on a tie win. Did they did they realize and celebrate these big moments with you? Or were they kind of like, oh, Greta's off doing her thing. Cool. Like school? Yeah. Yeah, they were very, very supportive. Like so, so supportive. I mean, particularly like the music department. Um, 
But I think in general, everyone was really amazing. But I think the thing about my connection to the music department at Princess Hill was that my singing teacher who worked there at the time, a woman called Miriam, um, had been my singing teacher since I was in year seven. Um, and since then I had always like brought my songs to her first when I was writing. So when I was in year eight, the songs were probably at a point where she was like, would you think about getting these recorded or like demoed professionally? And then she introduced me to um, a producer called Josh Barber who made my first two EPs. So like the roots of the project are essentially like in that music department because of Miriam. So like, yeah, I mean, they were always going to be wonderful and it felt, it feels like really nice to be in a school environment and feel like not only do you have like a home in like your social circles and your like really close friends and all of that because that's so important but also I think just in like you know in that music department I really felt like I had a place there and I think mm. a lot of people in the department really felt that security and safety and just the fact that we could all like bond and sing together and yeah it was a good time. That's really sweet. Tell me about your other home away from home in London. Do, was that a long period of time that you spent there? And would you would you still be over there if it weren't for coronavirus? Um, I was really like back and forth between here and London mm -hmm. after I finished school because my management is based in London. So I was, I think I counted before I went over there at the beginning of 2020 to ideally my plan was to like settle there for like at least a second, like, I would always go for like three weeks at a time, which was never enough. I was like, I'll do like a couple of months at least. And that didn't even happen. But um, I think I went like seven or eight times, like in between wow. 2017 and 2019, which is kind of just stupid. And I think that I was really feeling like I need to, I don't know, this feels really weird, especially just like flying on a plane that much, like with the environment feels really weird to know that that's how regularly you've gone to the same place for the same reason. It's like, maybe we just need to land there for a little bit. Like maybe that's the better, more sustainable flash. Like it makes more sense as an option. So yeah, I ended up like kind of getting, I think nine songs done for the record. Cause I recorded that in Sydney and I was like, well, we'll have plenty of time to like do the remaining songs because we've got all of the duologies done. Um, and we can do the other songs once we've kind of started the rollout, which will start when I'm in London, we'll make the creative content there. Like I had, yeah, had a totally different plan. Um, and then, yeah, Miss Rona, she <laughs> said no. So I came home in like mid-March. Um, but I, I love London so much and I, I miss it more and more at the moment, I think as the world's beginning to open up in some places like, yeah, I think that there's a really big part of like myself there, which is really odd when it is so far away from where I'm mm -hmm. from. But um, the good thing about London was that, especially when I was writing the record, it offered me this space that I could go where I didn't really have the association of like, you know, all of the high school staff or like my relationship at the time. Like there was nothing that kind of attached me to, it, it was just like work related really, like work and then like myself, my own identity mm. outside of all that stuff. So you really get to know more of yourself in that way when you have a space like that. And so, yeah, I really, like all of my journal entries from that time, if I was ever in a, and I often was, in like a tumultuous time in like my personal life or whatever, like I would always end entries with like, well, it's okay though, because like I'm going to London like at the end of the month and I'm just gonna work and I'm so excited. So yeah, it's definitely a very dear place to me and I am looking forward to going back when it's safe to and um, yeah, spending some more time there. Now oh, that's such a sweet relationship with the city. Okay, so all of the yeah. songs that weren't <laughs> in the duologies, were they London created or? Have I, which ones were which ones were London born? Uh, ooh, okay, the ones that were London born were Wellbe Wise, um, The Cure. Mm -hmm. um, funny thing was like, oh, Ready Made was London born. Uh, a lot of the songs that like didn't end up making the record as well were London born because I think like there was one particular trip where I went and I was just really sad about some stuff and I just went into so many sessions and I just wrote and wrote and wrote but when you're in like the depth of your feels you often just have to write 
stuff to get off your chest and then ultimately discard or it's not yeah. really like but then there are these little gems that come out through that vulnerability and for me like one of those moments was the cure so i'd written like all of these songs some of which i liked but just like maybe weren't necessarily at the standard that i kind of wanted them to be and then i like woke up one morning and went into the studio with Johnny Hawkins and wrote The Cure. And I was like, this is what this whole week's actually been about. <laughs> it's like getting this song. So um, quite literally yeah. The Cure to all that other sadness I was talking about a mess. And now we have The Cure of it all. I love yes. that. Yes, yes, yeah. Oh. Exactly, appropriate title. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, was there like a song on there that you were most nervous for your family to hear then, considering that they are uh, very personal? Ooh. Not really, actually. I think the, <laughs> the thing about my family and I, and I also probably how the songs are written as well, is like I, I do think that the songs are written in a way where maybe even though it's kind of unpacking some like really vulnerable emotions that like I did once feel, like I think that they're pretty universal and can like be pretty translatable to the next person that like okay, hears okay. the song, has their own journey with them. So that for one, but also like, you write about what you're going through. I live with my family and they saw everything. <laughs> so <laughs> straight up thank you. Already. Like, yeah. And I've been doing that also in terms of like translating my emotions into song since I was like a tiny, tiny little person. So it's not anything new for one, but also they saw me in a way that was just like, oh my gosh, you're, you've lost like all your self-confidence like I was just a shell of myself after this particular relationship and there was like a lot of rebuilding that I needed to do and I was able to do that through the song so I think if anything rather than feeling nervous I was probably more proud to be able to show them and be like hey I'm so embarrassed actually that like I was feeling this way but look what I turned it into so I think in that sense yeah I mean also we're a very open family in this yeah. house we talk about our feelings a lot so that's the answer <laughs> that sounds very healthy. We love to hear it. <laughs> I'm super intrigued about the cut up um, snippets. I think they were, are they reversed in the beginning of Paris? Ooh, yeah. Tell me about those little moments. Because you have a couple of songs in there where you use recorded parts, like in It's Almost Christmas Time in Philly and things like that. Hmm. Um, I think with the intro of Paris, if I remember correctly, um, the voice memo that we've used, it's not reversed, but once the instruments come in, it's side chained. So it kind oh, of has like yep, a yep. kind of rhythmic feel to it. But I recorded the voice memo when my girlfriends and I were in Paris and I'd gone to get a coffee and I had a song idea. And like, you can probably hear like tiny little, little snippets of it in the song, but like very, very barely. That's just like, I recorded about 40 seconds of just the Paris craziness and I was walk, I was like near the main train station and then I started seeing the song idea that I had. And so when I started writing Paris, um, or I guess when we were kind of producing it somewhat, when we had finished most of the song, I was like, I know the perfect thing. It's just gonna like totally place us right in this spot that we need to be like visually for this song. Um, so yeah, and then we just like put some other little things that felt a little bit like French or like Paris, like we have like, there's a bicycle wheel in there, I think. And okay. there's this like little bird sounds as well. And then at the end, like the, I feel like the acoustic guitar that Kieran plays at the very end is just very, it sets the scene, I think. I, I like to, I really hope that people like imagine themselves in like a park in Paris or in like a really beautiful part of that city. So, yeah. Oh, hell yeah. I feel like we're really traveling the world in this album then. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> bit of Philly, so bit of London, bit of Paris. Yeah, I mean, it's funny. And actually on Worldly Wise, there's this voice memo oh, cool. at the end. Um, my girlfriends and I, in um, we're on Amalfi Coast and oh. my girlfriends are talking to a local, like in Italian. Like you can only really oh. faintly hear it, but just like we're on the beach. And um, yeah, 2019 was a year that at the time I categorized as being like, oh, it's really weird. I think just because I was going through some stuff and that ended up on the record. but. I mean, when I think about it now, especially doing all this promo for the record, I'm like, who would have thought? Like, that was a crazy year, actually, in terms of just how much I was moving around, how many places I was lucky enough to go in the world, all of these different songs that I wrote all over the world. And 
now I've made it into this physical thing and I'm like trying to get people hyped about it from the space of my bedroom, which I've spent so long in <laughs> the past 18 months. Like it's crazy, <laughs> but it does allow, I think, maybe an extra sense of gratitude for the fact that A, I got that time and B, I was able to like put it into music and make this thing. Like when you open the vinyl, there's like all of these photos from like film photos from that travel period. Um, which is really cool. So, and yeah, I think I'm so lucky that I got to do all of those things, especially at that point in my life, because mm. when you finish high school, like, I mean, I had the kind of thing of, okay, there's an element of like, this is my job. Like I go to write songs and I go to play shows and stuff, but just like either way, like you're supposed to go and travel with your friends. Like you're supposed to like go out into the world. And like, that's just been totally ripped from a whole bunch of people because of the fact that this pandemic has happened. So, I mean, if they haven't gotten the chance to do that yet, then that maybe if they like my record, it will take them there for the time being. In the meantime, it can be Yeah, I can little... satiate it for, for now. All right, well, yeah. this is a nice spot to kind of wrap up on. Then what would you be telling yourself five years ago, kind of looking back from the opposite end of the album now? Hmm. Five years ago. Mm. So funny. 2016. Like... Jesus. I don't know what I would say to that person, but uh, this is funny because I was like re-watching a Taylor Swift interview the other day and she gets asked like, where do you think you'll be in 10 years? And it's from 10 years ago. And she goes, whoa, that is such a hard question. And then she like freaks out and it's anyway. Um, I feel like if I were to speak to myself five years ago. It is a coming of age album. What would yeah. be the hindsight you've learned? I mean, I want to be able to say something like, it's going to be a really interesting next couple of years and there'll be some things that happen that initially feel like really, really correct and then they are totally not actually the way that it's meant to be. But that's going to be okay because ultimately it's going to like teach all these lessons and and make you a more seasoned musician for one but I think also like a stronger person in your sense of self but it won't go the way that you predict it's going to go but that will be the right way if that makes sense but I feel like that's a pretty standard thing to say to someone that's 18 like and also I know that I'd probably say the same thing to myself five years from now like you always want to do that thing and be like I was just a baby then I didn't know anything um but I think now like having written that record I think embracing that idea that it's like yeah maybe I will wake up tomorrow and feel differently about this thing and that's okay knowing that that is fine is kind of something that I've learned from writing the record I definitely didn't used to think like that I was like I just have this one thing and this will be it and life's not really like that and that's okay that's exciting and terrifying and it makes for good songs so yeah hey we have a whole album to show for it Greta it's been so <laughs> lovely to talk to you thank you you too thanks for having me <laughs>